started off with our Wonder Woman panel. We're ending up with our, well, we're not quite ending up. We've got a couple more things. Uh, but we're moving on to our Grumpy Old Farts panel. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and what we thought we would do, this is, this is part in part uh, the replacement for Amanda Spielman, who is sadly unable to be with us today. Uh, and I know that David is going to say a little bit more on that. But we also thought it might be interesting to you to um, hear a little bit about what the education systems are looking like in Wales and Scotland. And David has joined us at very late notice to talk a little bit about um, international education. And uh, Tom has very gamely and bravely uh, volunteered to step into <laughs> sticking up for the English education system um, and perhaps uh, promoting that. So we're going to spend about 15, 20 minutes on this. Then we have three very brave young women who've travelled here from Manchester and Bolton uh, who are uh, students, currently students, at, uh, in, at schools in Manchester, Loretta High School and at Turton High School in Bolton. And they're going to address you with their thoughts about education and we've invited Ros Wilson, uh, Emma Hardy and Kevin Courtney to respond to that but also for you to kind of, if you want to, to respond. We'll have our prize draw. Mick Waters and Hal Roberts have planned God knows what for you. Uh, I can guarantee it will make you laugh. Um, but or cry. <laughs> but, or cry. Uh, but uh, I can't guarantee anything more than that because I've absolutely no idea what's going on. So, we shall begin. Uh, and what I'd like to do, first of all, is to in invite each of our panellists to just make a short statement uh, Mick is representing Wales, even though he's been very much involved in the English education system, but he's um, working in, in Wales at the moment, developing their new curriculum, which I think is really exciting. Uh, David, for many years, was involved in developing education across Scotland and, and was involved in the Curriculum for Excellence in Scotland. And Tom, I'm sure you all know, has spent many years as a head teacher in the English system. So. I would invite, first of all, please, Tom, if you don't mind, to say your piece. Right. Yes? Sorry, just before we do that, can, can I just make a statement, um, which is to say that Amanda Spielman wasn't unable to come today. She chose not to come because she felt that it was too close after the election, and she felt that the format of an interview might have meant that she was being lured into an indiscretion. Now, I have to say, the last time I lured a woman into an, an indiscretion <laughs> was probably around about 1974. So I don't think that danger was particularly imminent. And it concerns me for two reasons, and I think it's important to mention them. The first reason is that if an inspector who is supposed to guarantee the independence of the system through a quality assurance mechanism which is open and fair, feels that they cannot be in an environment where they're made accountable to the teachers who deliver education of the highest standard that they possibly can across the country. And if they feel that they cannot do that without having a policy brief from government, I feel that sold short the concept of an independent inspectorate. An inspector should never be in a position, particularly a chief inspector, should never be in a position where they are inspecting their own advice. And as soon as an inspectorate is politically compromised, they have lost the possibility of doing the job that they are employed to do, which is to protect the consistency of quality for children and young people across the country not to enforce the delivery of someone else's agenda. And I think I would add to that that anyone who claims the right to hold us accountable should also take on the responsibility for being accountable to us. 500 educators today have entered into a sauna. And in that sauna, <laughs> they've experienced not only the burning heat, 
of the burning heat. But they've also exposed themselves to the burning heat of ideas, and they haven't all been consistent. We've had people here who have taken different views on the curriculum. We have people here who have offered different experiences. This has not been a gathering of people who represent the alternative in education, nor, as somebody suggested this morning, this is the one for the progs, while the Michaela event today is the one for the trads. You people here are not clichés. You're people who day and daily attempt to do your best for the children and young people in your care or the teachers that you work with. You have a right to hear from those who will judge you. And I am sadly disappointed that Ms Spielman felt that she couldn't honour that responsibility to you. And I hope that there will be other opportunities for her so to do. But you're going to have to put up with the grumpy old farts and Tom Sherrington. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, David. I think you summed up what a lot of people in the room uh, were thinking. And I look forward to welcoming Amanda next year to Northern Rocks. Uh, but we shall, we shall move on. And I would invite Tom to uh, speak on behalf of the English education and what, system and what you observe in terms of its unique features. Thank you. I don't think I've ever had such an extraordinary build-up. The grumpy old farts, I have to own that now. Um, I like Amanda. I think actually she's somebody we, we need to learn to work with, and um, I'm hoping that that will come through. So um, I think when she was at Ofqual, I learned a lot from her. I had a lot of meetings with her to talk about assessment, and, um, and I found that, that I could connect with her. So I'm hoping that comes through. Um, so I get to play for England now, which is very exciting. Um, I'm not, I think it's important to, to, think, you know, to, to touch on certain things, but I, I want to be as positive as possible. I think we do have serious issues with funding, and I'm not going to go into, much, into that too much, but I think it's a real issue that we do face in schools, and anyone who tries to, to pretend, pretend we don't have a funding crisis is, it just hasn't been working in a school. And recruitment is a big issue, and, I, and again, it's a similar thing. For me, I think one of our biggest challenges is to get our accountability system right. I think it's still excessively uh, dominant in schools, and I think it has brutal consequences, which I've personally experienced, and I know having been through that experience, I've become a kind of a focal point for other people to share their experiences with me. And I've been contacted by just countless people, you know, uh, between sort of 50 and 60 people uh, in really cr chronic situations now working in schools have been reaching out to me in the last few weeks to say, um, you know, how tough their, their working life is because of the accountability pressure. And that's just outrageous and unsustainable. And I think it doesn't help that the, that the kind of Ofsted machinery has a sort of relentless PR campaign where they try to present themselves as, as the good guys. I find that kind of in, uh, offensive, really, um, when really they only are if, you'll get, if you get a good judgment. But I do think we have a lot going for us. I really do think that in our system, which really isn't a system, it's a kind of collection of systems uh, loosely gathered together, um, does have lots of advantages, and sometimes I think we just need to learn to be bold enough to take advantage of them. I do think we're, into, we're going to enter a period of really good curriculum stability uh, now with the exam reforms having happened, uh, that schools can start to kind of take them more in their stride and the curriculum changes will be there so we can start really talking about what goes on in classrooms much more, and I think that's a good opportunity. I really think we have a lot more autonomy as teachers for what we do in lessons. Um, than people sometimes believe. And I, I, what I do believe is coming through from the inspectorate is there isn't a, a set agenda for how teaching should be done. And I'm excited in England to buy the debate about how we teach the role for you know, evidence-based practice, evidence-informed practice is really a, is what I'd phrase I, should, I would prefer. And, and teachers thinking about the knowledge that they teach, why they teach what they teach, and how they deliver it. I think it's exciting. And the debates we have up and down the country in schools and at events like this, like Research Shed, like the Wellington Festival next week, whatever the event is, there's great discussion going on in England about, about these pr practices. And I, and I find that incredibly exciting. It's great to be part of. I think we're, in England we have the opportunity to have even this event. We have a good sort of culture of grassroots movements which 
teachers can be involved in. Um, and I don't think that's something we should take for granted. It's part of our culture as a system that, that we are invited to lead and to sort of shape the agenda. And I think we should use our muscle in that area far more than we do as school leaders uh, and as also as teachers. For example, one of the grassroots movements I'm involved in is trying to establish a national baccalaureate for England, which is still in a sort of piloting phase. But it's exciting that we feel like we could take that territory and say, we want to set up a national baccalaureate for England and just do it. And we've got loads of support. We just need more schools to kind of pilot it. But that's exciting. Generally, I think, just to, to go back to a more of a negative, I do think schools are overburdened with expectations about our role as, a, as sort of social care agencies. Um, and that's taken for granted in the accountability system. So in a, school, a lot of schools, if you, once you get to 50% plus pupil premium, you're not just a school educating kids. You're, you are a social care agency, and it's because of the school's work that families, communities are held together and you get almost no credit for it whatsoever. Um, and every time a, a prime minister or a minister says, mental health's a problem, we'll just train a few teachers for a couple of hours and that'll sort it. It's just a joke. Um, things like prevent in schools, I think, is a disaster. Um, because we're just not in a position to do what we're expected to do, as well as teach, learn, and get kids to sort of pass exams. So there's, there's a lot going on in what I've just said there. I think what we need to do from that is kind of mobilise and seize the initiative where we can and be more bold about saying, this is our school, this is what we believe in. We're using existing evidence, we're doing a fantastic job and come and see it and be slightly less in hock to the accountability pressure, however hard that is to do. And God knows I know only too well. David, do you want to talk about Scotland? I want to talk a bit about Scotland because one of the things I think it's really important to recognise is that some of the things that Tom said about community in England frankly are impossible to realise here because you've lost the idea of comprehensive education totally. And comprehensive education is built into the DNA of the Scottish system. That was a phrase that was used by colleagues when we met. People go to school in Scotland based overwhelmingly on place. School choice beyond an immediate geographic areas is virtually insignificant in the Scottish system, as is private education. Out with Edinburgh and Glasgow, private education plays virtually no part at all in the Scottish system. We don't have grammar schools, and there's a price to be paid for that uniformity. We possibly don't have the innovation we possibly don't have the drive nor the sense of urgency that I think exists in England. And I don't think we have the capacity to, to make change as rapidly and as effectively as you do in England. And I think that what you have in England is I think you have the drive, but not always the direction. And in Scotland, what we still have is this sense of school as something that represents place. And within that, it opens up other possibilities. And the biggest possibility opens up is a different conversation. Sorry, I'm going to get really emotional about this. Because after Manchester and London, all we could talk about was the number of police and not the number of youth workers. After Manchester and London, we didn't talk about outreach drama workers. We didn't talk about people going out into the community. When we talked about the prevention agenda, we talked about teachers who didn't even necessarily serve these communities. We didn't talk about people working within these communities, supporting them and getting to know them. That possibility exists much more strongly in Scotland than it does here in England. It exists strongly in Wales as well. What we haven't done in Scotland is we haven't successfully capitalised on the advantages that we have. I know that there are people in England, and one of them was writing recently in the Times Educational Supplement, who think that Curriculum for Excellence is some skills-based free-for-all that's based on a few capacities and it has no fundamental roots in knowledge. That's not the case. We have failed in Scotland to deliver on the potential of Curriculum for Excellence, and that doesn't make it a flawed idea. 
The knowledge-rich discussion that Tom referred to in England goes on in Scotland too, and it's championed by Professor Mark Priestley of Stirling University, who is well worth checking out and has been an influential force in Scotland, increasingly in Wales, and also works in Northern Ireland. But the other key thing that I want to pick up on in this is that when we had the Four Countries event that Debbie referred to, we brought together educators from all four parts of the United Kingdom. We tried to make sure that we had a mix of teachers, head teachers, people with different experiences and at different stages in education. When we spoke as we're doing now about the systems in the different countries, we described diversity, but that diversity was driven by politics and ideology. When we took that restraint away and asked people to talk together about values, when we asked them to talk about the purpose of education, what we had across the representatives from all four countries was consensus and consistency. What we had was a common ambition. And do you know what? That common ambition was absolutely captured on this morning's panel. And it's been captured in session after session in the workshops here today. It was a recognition, as I tweeted earlier on today, that we need to stop, particularly in England, asking the question, who are we better than? And starting to ask the question, who are we good enough for? To ask the question, are we good enough to rescue Jazz Ampo Far from the horrific background and circumstances that she grew up in? Are we good enough to make a difference for young people like her and like Chris Kilkenny and others who've spoken here at this conference? And we need to start asking that question regardless of what we are. And that means we need to stop dismissing what is happening in other parts of the United Kingdom. We need to engage with it. We need to learn from the strengths in England that Tom's rightly identified. We need to learn from the strengths that Mick will identify in terms of Wales and anything that Tom, sorry, David might say about the international system. Because we are past the time of conflict and into the time of collaboration. What we've seen in the last week has been a rising wave of hope. We have seen young people stand up and say, we will not be ignored, we will not be dismissed, we will not hide behind our screens. We are going to make our demands felt in the system. We need to seize this time, people. First, we take Manhattan. <laughs> then we take Berlin. <laughs> Do you want to follow that, Mick? <laughs> uh, good day. Uh, uh, Wales is fascinating. It's, it's undergoing... Uh, a wholesale review of its education system. As it's reviewing, it's changing. Uh, I've been working there for 18 months through my university role, and it's been the most exhilarating 18 months to be with teachers and others in the system who are trying genuinely to make a massive difference. Wales was uh, considerably worried about its education system a, a few years ago, and they sent for a Scotsman called... Uh, Donaldson, Graham Donaldson, and he spent some time in Wales carrying out a formal review of their education system, and after a year, he, he issued his report, which had 64 recommendations, and basically he was saying, we need to tell a different story, and we need to tell that story better, and we need to follow this story through to the end, and it begins with what we want our young people to be, and it follows through the teaching and how we look at it, and how we test it, and how we uh, make it accountable and so on. What sort of schools we want. And his 64 recommendations were accepted in total, absolutely entirely, by the government, the then minister. He thought there'd be some sort of moderation, but no, they said, let's do it. In the middle of his, his uh, recommendations is one that I think is really, really pertinent to the conversation we are having, which is that uh, there should be a notion of subsidiarity mm. in everything that happens. I don't know about you, but I had to go and look it up, because I didn't know what it meant. But basically, 
it, it means that decisions need to be made at the nearest point to which they matter. Now, I don't want this to sound uh, hierarchical every, or anything, but they need not to be made at government level if they're school decisions. They need not to be made by school leaders if they're decisions that teachers can make. Teaching assistants can make decisions that affect the lives of children if they're clear what the big picture is. And the work since then has been about the big picture and making it move forward. I think the massive thrust in Wales is for uh, increased and valued professionalism on the part of everybody who works with young people. And it really is a delight to see the way that the government, the cabinet secretary and the government officers are really taking to heart Graham Donaldson's recommendations and trying to help it to happen whilst allowing this subsidiarity to work. Because somebody's got to coordinate it and I think they're playing an incredibly good game in not taking it over but trying to push the ripples through the system. So currently in Wales uh, there is a, a move towards a new curriculum uh, which has four aims, four purposes for young people which is driving everything and I won't visit them all because you, you know time will go. That curriculum is followed by looking carefully at what sort of teaching that means and so initial teacher education is being reviewed and is being changed so that teachers coming into the system will be better placed to enable that curriculum to happen. It's built on partnership. At the same time, there is a, an effort towards redefining what the professional job of a teacher and a school leader is. And I've been fundamentally involved in that policy work. And as an example, that policy work has taken me to work uh, properly with I reckon about 400 teachers in some depth on these standards for professionalism. And it's taken a year and a half and we've got 31 sentences. And people could say, is that it then? And actually what it is, is the trigger for so much positive work that's absolutely brilliant to see. The, uh, the, there is a, an academy for teaching and learning which the, the Welsh Government is prepared to support but they're insisting that the academy runs itself and it is run by the leaders of school, uh, schools in Wales, for the schools in Wales. And throughout this process, heads and teachers have been talked with and enabled to talk for themselves. And constantly you hear the, th the little phrase, it's great, but what about accountability? And Wales, like everywhere else in the UK, has got the problem of assessment driving so many other things and the problem of categorising schools and implying that the good schools can help the weaker schools and everything will be all right. And they found that they're chasing themselves a lot of the time. And gaming comes into that, the fact that a lot of people will now acknowledge that we game the system in order to achieve the things that will get the pressure off us. And in Wales, they've started a fantastic conversation about how gaming happens and how we stop it and uh, accountability is the next agenda. And on Tuesday, there is a big, big conference for head teachers talking about if we really want to move the system forward, how can you help us to change accountability? We heard this morning about democracy means that we've got to enact the things that our democratic people decide are right, but the democratic people are asking the head teachers and teachers, what can we do to make it work for every child in every school, in every community, in every, cent in every corner of Wales. So I'll finish there, but just to say across Wales at the minute, it is the most optimistic educational place that I've worked in for years. It is the most buoyant place in terms of what we're trying to do for our children. Uh, at the same time, there's a deal of tentativeness because when you ask people to try something very, very different, there's an enormous amount of nervousness about taking the steps towards an unknown for many, many people. So I think that it's a brilliant time. I think there is direction, but it's controlled direction. I think there is drive, but it's controlled drive. And I think there is just the most delightful desire to make it right for children. And it's a smashing place to be. There's a good advert for a job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Um, I'm going to just invite David to speak briefly. I just I need to let you know that David was asked to do this like about an hour ago, yes, and <laughs> and um, and he's just going to reflect a little bit on his experiences of teaching internationally. Particularly, I think you spend a lot of time in Australia, don't you, David? Um, so, and, and because of the in interest because of the shortage of time and how much we have to get through. I think after David's spoken, uh, we will have the prize draw and invite the um, next panel up um, for, for that, if that's all right, and not move on to questions. Uh, but I think you'll agree, you know, it's, what we're seeing here is a really fascinating deconstruction of, of the idea that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and that what we, what we see as our everyday lived experience is not actually the everyday lived experience of most people in the world, never mind, in the United Kingdom. Uh, that gives me a bit of hope. Because you don't have to move far to go to Wales, I think. <laughs> so, anyway, if we've got a teacher shortage in England, look out, British uh, English government, because we'll all just hop over the border and then you'll be really stuffed. Right. David. Right. <laughs> um, this will be a really quick trot through. These are, um, I, I can only refer to countries that I've done some training in, I would say, within the last 12 months. Um, but there are some patterns which I think are starting to emerge. I suppose a lot of my work has been in Australia. Um, if you had to summarize attitudes in Australia, they kind of say, why do we adopt failed UK policies from like 20 years ago when we know they won't work? Uh, Australia, which had a perfectly good education system, is gripped like the rest of the world, rest, certainly the rest of the developed world with PISA hysteria. So if I was to put another sweeping generalization, at the, at the last count, I heard 30 different countries have said that their ambition is to get within the top five in PISA within the next five years. So mathematically, it's not possible, but it's, it's dominating all the kind of discourse. Um, USA, I think, is particularly interesting because in some ways it's got some of the best and the, and the worst examples uh, of schooling, but there is generally, I think, that pendulum that we've had about high accountability, it's starting to swing back, and it's partly because business leaders are starting to get more involved in education. Um, I wish I could say the same here, and it isn't because business leaders don't want to get involved in education, but uh, it was reported that when Michael Gove was told about you know, 21st century skills, and that's what business leaders said they wanted, he said business leaders are talking out of their arse. So you, you do seem to have in some countries a recognition that the conversation has to be wider. We've got to bring in business leaders. We've got to talk about what are the, what are the skills actually needed for a radically altered future. Not the skills needed for the last industrial revolution, but the next one. Um, Ireland's really interesting because it's suddenly done well in, in Pisa. It has no idea why. It doesn't, but it is also going through curriculum change, and it's bringing in what I would say is a more holistic uh, uh, curriculum, the introducing philosophy um, in schools. Singapore is one of those countries that it's, you know, it's, it's as high up in the PSA League tables as you can get, but it realizes that there's an absolute crisis, uh, and you've now got the bizarre situation where the schools minister is telling parents to back off their own kids because they're getting stressed and committing suicide. So that's, it's, it's really interesting what's going on there. They're saying, you know, PISA was, was not a good thing that happened to us as a country. Um, so, if you were to try and, uh, you know, again, generalize, um, what's really interesting is when people that I meet ask me about UK education, what they really mean is English education. So they'll say, what, what's going on in England? It just seems really weird. But, but they're not talking about Wales, they're not talking about Scotland, really they're talking about the UK. And when you look at the, the shifts that are going on, I think, internationally, it seems to me some, some countries are resisting um, the, this sweep towards uh, higher stakes accountability, partly through geography. So Australia, it's got a federal system. It'll probably never have a truly national curriculum mandated. Um, but I think others are just recognizing that they have to start trusting the profession. 
And I, I, I did a, uh, an event with Pazzi Salberg in, um, in Australia, and I said to him, Pazzi, you've done a lot of work in England. What, how would you, what would you say is the biggest difference between Finland and all your success there in England? And he says, it's easy. He said, in Finland, we decided about 70 years ago what the purpose of education was going to be. And every government since then has pretty much signed up to that. He said, in the UK, every five years, you reinvent the purpose of education and you spend more time arguing about that. And it's true that we haven't even cracked that one. As a country, we, as Mick said and as David passionately said, we're, not, we're just talking about league tables and, and scores. So it seems to me that we, I believe, to, to bring it back to the country that I live in, even though I don't do a great deal of work here, we need a new conversation. The conversation has been dominated by this Conservative government and the voices of teachers are not being heard and the voices of parents need to be brought into this. Because sadly, I think if you ask parents in this country now, we're going to get rid of league tables, they'd probably be the first ones to say, no, no, no don't. Because that's the only conversation they've been exposed to for the last 10, 15 years. It probably started with Tony Blair. So I think some of those new conversations are happening in, in other countries, and it's long overdue that we, that we change the conversation here. Just very quickly, I think that's been an encouraging discussion, because what Tom did was he said, let's make our conversations louder. And what he said fundamentally was, let's take control of the debates about those things that we can change. One of the key things that Mick did was he said, let's stop talking about autonomy and fragmentation. Let's talk about subsidiarity. And then what finally David said was, let's have clarity around purpose. You would get that clarity of purpose from the people who have spoken here today and the people who have attended here today. And the real encouragement that comes from this, I think, is that we're not a million miles away from common ground that can help us to make further progress. And whatever we feel the barriers are, we need to take Tom's advice and make sure that we're doing everything. And you people here today are at the absolute vanguard of that because you've made that commitment. And we thank you for that. And we hope that there are some lessons in this for how we can take your energy and channel it and move it forward. So thank you very much to you for that. And thank